It was five years ago that Reverend Tracy Blackman was invited to preach a Friday evening service at St. Paul's Memorial Church. Now, Reverend B Tracy Blackman is a name you should know. She is the United Church of Christ Associate General Minister and a frequently sought after speaker, especially about racial justice, which is why she was in Charlottesville, Virginia that night. As she stood in front of these worshipers gathered from around the country, she joked it was the first time she had preached to a standing room only crowd on a Friday night in church. Well, they were there to counter a rally the next day by newly emboldened neo-Confederates, neo-Nazis, KKK supporters, and other white nationalists. A rally had been called to, quote, unite the right. So in response, a group of clergy gathered to offer spiritual support to counter-protesters and offer a clear message that unite the right did not speak for all Christians. Those who showed up believed that Christians and other people of faith can't just stand around watching it happen. Reverend Blackman encouraged the congregation. When violence and hatred are flourishing, it is necessary for love to show up. When hatred is all around, when violence is the language of the day, when laws lack compassion and churches lose their way, those who believe in freedom, who believe in God, we must question, where have all the prophets gone? Here I am, a 54-year-old black woman, coming back because the Klan is rising. While she was preaching outside the church windows, there were flickering lights in the distance. They were not street lights, however, but tiki torches held aloft by white supremacists. When Reverend Blackman finished her sermon, anxious volunteers told her about a teeming mob, about 300 strong many in matching white polo shirts. They had, been walking, they had begun by walking menacingly around a statue of Robert E. Lee, screaming racist and anti-Semitic slogans, but they were on the move. And now, from across the street, they could be seen cresting the hill and marching toward them. It wasn't clear if they were coming to confront worshipers, but inside the church, they could hear chants of, you will not replace us. Worshippers prayed, they sang hymns to drown them out, but the fear was real. Organizers told no one to leave, and they locked the church doors. Except one white supremacist had already come in and was live streaming to his followers. After several hours of being confined inside the church, worshippers were escorted out the back to avoid attracting attention. Reverend Tracy Blackman wasn't having that. She and Dr. Cornell West resolved that they would leave through the front, but when they opened the door, she said, all I could see, as far as I could see, were flames and people chanting blood and soil and Jews will not replace us. And I decided this one time, I might go out the back door. Later that night, outside the church, Reverend Blackman was interviewed live on MSNBC by Joy Reid. Right in the middle of the interview, someone pulled on Reverend Blackman's arm, and all of a sudden, she was gone. Joy Reid was left wondering out loud on TV what was going on. We don't know what just happened. Later, she reported that Reverend Blackman was whisked away for her safety and that she was okay. But how could she be okay? How can anyone be okay? And I think that's the message Jesus is sending with his confounding words from today's text from the Gospel of Luke. Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, I have come instead to bring division. At first glance, this text makes absolutely no sense. It feels just completely out of place with the one we call the Prince of Peace. Just last week, this is just a few verses earlier in chapter 12, Jesus told his listeners, do not be afraid, don't worry. He called them his little flock and spoke of lilies and ravens and treasures in heaven. 
we think of Jesus saying, bring the little ones to me, do not hinder them, for to them belongs the kingdom of God. Over and over, those are the words we hold on to. Instead, in this passage, he spoke these strange and offensive words. From now on, households will be divided, three against two, two against three, father against son, mother against daughter, divisions among in-laws. What could he have possibly meant? Well, I think a key question we have to ask is, did he mean to deliberately divide people? Or is division a result of his message? There have been clues all along the way. In the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus stood to read from the scroll of Isaiah that he had been anointed by God to bring good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoner, liberation for the captive. We must realize that not everyone will hear that as good news. In fact, many will resist. Then Jesus proclaimed, Today in your hearing this scripture has been fulfilled. How'd that go over? Well, at first they were proud, boasting among themselves about Joseph's son. Everyone exclaimed, what a nice young man. He should have quit while he was ahead. By the time he had finished talking, His hometown crowd was so enraged, they ran him out of town with the intention of throwing him off a cliff. While they were arguing among themselves, Jesus passed right through the middle of them and off on his way. You know, Mary, she knew the child she was carrying in her womb would upset the world. The hungry filled with good things isn't going to please the rich walking away empty-handed. The powerful brought down from their thrones while the humble are lifted high are not going to sit around enjoying a new view of the world. They're going to fight back. As you know, Jesus was often provocative, getting under the skin, especially of the ones tasked with enforcing purity and making sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed. I mean, you don't call religious people hypocrites and broods of vipers, and expect them to respond by saying, thank you. Did Jesus come to cause division? Was that his intention? Or is it true that following Jesus can't help but cause division? Now, I'll admit, I would prefer if his message had been, I've come to bring unity among divided people. Wouldn't that make so much more sense? I mean, that's what we need right now, especially. But you can't bring unity without addressing that which divides us. No reconciliation without truth. Otherwise, all we have done is succeeded in keeping things as they are. For the comfortable, that's not so bad. For those at the top, that's terrific. But for Christians, followers of Jesus who came on behalf of the people at the bottom, for anyone excluded, hated, or reviled, that is unacceptable. It's not okay. Charlottesville was religious extremism on clear display easy for anyone to denounce. Well, it should have been easy for everyone to denounce. And while Charlottesville may have been five years ago, the ideology behind it is just as real and gaining power every day. And it's fueled by an imposter masquerading as Christianity. This imposter is draped in innocent language about the founding of the United States as a Christian nation. The insistence that we are a nation not characterized by the separation of church and state, but a a nation in which the two are the same, seeking the enforcement of biblical laws by Christian judges and descriptions of real Americans. 
Now, we can disagree about some of these ideas, but let's be clear, it's not Christianity. It is Christian nationalism, and it's growing in popularity and influence among much of white Christianity. You might hear it called religious liberty, and its intent, but its intent is Christian privilege. And when that qu privilege is questioned, cries of persecution. Charlottesville's you will not replace us hides behind such slogans as take America back for God. It glorifies depictions of a warrior Christ. And although it appears innocuous, it inspires violence. Intimidation, harassment, and murder, such as Charlottesville, Mother Emanuel African Methodist Church in Charleston, the massacre of worshipers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the mass shooting at the synagogue right here in Poway in 2019. Because they might replace us, it tolerates children separated from their parents as acceptable punishment and it looks the other way at violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Christian nationalism creates a false idol of power. Christianity doesn't need power. Christianity doesn't need power. Its power is love. Christianity is a gospel of love, a love for God, love from God, love for our neighbor, every neighbor, and even love for enemies. But love is never okay with suffering for some and victory for others, because that is an absolute abuse of power. So therefore, Jesus asks, do you think I've come to smooth things over and make everything nice? Not so. I've come to disrupt and confront. That's Eugene Peterson's insightful translation of our passage today in the message. And who wouldn't prefer Jesus to smooth things over and make everything nice? Instead, Jesus speaks these words that are confounding and disturbing. They should cause us to pause, to ponder, the meaning and the implications. And it makes me ask, is it divisive to call out Christian nationalism? But this distortion of Christianity is causing great harm, and not only to people. It is a huge factor behind young Americans fleeing the church. It repulses young and old alike who will not stand for a religion that does not follow its own scripture to welcome immigrants and refugees, that does not care about the earth their own creator made. Who wants a religion that does not celebrate their friends of color or that would exclude members of their families who are LGBTQ? Personally, if the alternative was that or nothing, I'd take nothing. I'd be the first one out the door of the church. I'd simply follow Jesus on my own and perhaps find two or three to gather in his name. Jeez, Jesus, thank you for churches like this and Christians like you. Not that we don't have our own issues. And we should never remember, to, uh, never forget to remove the log from our own eye before pointing out the splinter in our neighbor's. But I, I want to bring Christian nationalism into the light so we understand what we're doing. On a steamy August evening in Virginia, Reverend Blackman encouraged the congregation, we who believe in freedom, who believe in God, when violence and hatred are flourishing, it is necessary for love to show up. I can only conclude that following Jesus will logically cause division because it clarifies our values and makes us ask, with whom do you stand? It doesn't require a mean spirit. Got that? But it does require a choice. 
and it's not always easy. But we will never regret choosing love over power. Therefore, in the words of Sister Ruth Fox, may God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those for whom they have suffering, pain and rejection of war, so that we may reach out our hands to, com to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen.